Ryan Neubauer, and welcome to the Piano Lessons 123 Lecture Series. I'd like to give credit for the intro theme to Yamaha. I'm not sponsored by them, and we are not affiliated, but I own one of their keyboards, and it is fantastic, so I thought I'd use it today. If you haven't been with me before, I'd like to extend a welcome, mind the puns, and introduce you to some music theory concepts, more specifically compound intervals, consonants, and dissonance, not incontinent. Uh, that would be bad. Don't do that here. Uh, anyways, I'd like to change up this series a little bit. Instead of having the video half theory and half at the keyboard, from now on I'm going to have two separate series. So the first is going to be a music theory only series, and the other will be strictly dedicated to piano technique. I hope that doesn't bother anyone. If it does, please comment, and I will do my best to change it up. Uh, also, a reminder, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. Every like, comment, and share gains viewers. More viewers equals better videos. So, without further ado, let's begin with compound intervals. Last time we talked about standard intervals, up to and including an octave, or a perfect eighth. Up here I have driven, driven, drawn a perfect eighth, major ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth, and thirteenth. And that is about as high as we go. You could, in theory, extend to fourteenth, fifteenth, sixteenth, uh, if you like to be in pain. But let's stay with thirteenth. Uh, as far as jazz theory, this is sort of an extension into that. You don't see 13th too often in classical music. However, they do appear. Uh, it's more of a modern notation. The only difference, there's an octave. So if you look at this, this octave, C to C, is an octave. It's also a perfect eighth. However, if we were to draw C here, it would be a perfect unison. Do you agree? If we continue to draw a C below each of these octaves, we can see that these compound intervals can be reduced to standard intervals. So C to D, that is a major second. C to E, major third. C to F, perfect fourth. For fourths and fifths, we do not call them major or minor. We call them perfect, diminished, or augmented, or a tritone. Uh, if you're confused about what those are, please see my previous video, lesson three. And the 13th would be a major 6th. Now this is with respect to C major. If we change the key, we can build the same intervals using the appropriate number of half steps, once again in the previous video, and alter these to be major, minor, or augmented. So, C to D, that is a major 2nd or major ninth. We can alter that with sharps or flats to increase the number or decrease the number of half steps, respectively. And if we were to add a sharp, it would become an augmented ninth, or an augmented, or yes, an augmented second, excuse me. Or we could put D flat instead and have it be a minor ninth or a minor second. Now, the only difference between the second and the ninth is the spacing. So the C is one octave lower. So it's these intervals plus an octave. As far as conventions and rules, everything that applies to standard intervals applies to compound intervals. The only difference is the amount of space between them. So without further notice, I would like to move on to consonants and dissonance. Now, to help you with consonants and dissonance, I would like you to learn how to draw a piano keyboard. Up here I have a rectangle, and I've drawn within that rectangle seven vertical lines. Now, to make this a keyboard, if you can't visualize it, please go to a keyboard to do this. And we're going to add the black keys. We can pretend that these big rectangles are the white keys on the keyboard, and that the black keys will be up here. So we are going to simply add in black keys, and if you don't know what I'm doing, it's because you're not looking at a piano. If you do, it will make perfect sense to you. Now you can draw at least one octave worth of keys, if not more, more is fine, uh, but you only really need one octave. And now, if you're ever taking an exam, you can, if you can't visualize it, you have this reference to go back. Okay, this is a fourth, so you could go C up to F if you needed to. If you can visualize it, you don't have to do this, but until you get to the point where you can visualize it, it's best to draw it out. Next, what is consonance and dissonance? Well, consonance 
are tones that sound good together, ones that sound resolute, that don't want to move anywhere. Uh, they're stable. So I'm going to play through on this keyboard that's in front of me. I'm going to use a string voice so that you can hear it better. I'm going to play through the C major scale, and I'm not going to stop, C to C, one octave as we have drawn here. <laughs> Now, I'm going to play notes together. So I'm going to start with C to D. And together. Now, if you're trying to think of consonant or dissonant, think consonant sounds good together, dissonant sounds like there's tension, needs relief, or, or it just uh, sounds unstable. It wants to go somewhere else. So I'd like you to hear that C to D is rather dissonant. Now I'll play C to E. That is the major third, and it is a consonant interval. Now I'll play the perfect fourth of C to F. I'll play the perfect fifth of C to G. I'll play C to A, the major sixth. And I'll play C to B, the major seventh. Play C to C the octave. Some of those were consonant, some of those were dissonant. Now we're going to put into terms which are consonant and which are dissonant, and this is true for any set of notes as long as they follow the interval rules. So consonant intervals, what are they? Which ones are considered consonant? So intervals that are a perfect unison or octave are consonant. Intervals that are a third are consonant. Intervals that are a fifth are consonant. And intervals that are a sixth are consonant. And this is true for their major or minor versions with the exception of the fifth, and we'll get into why. So let me circle that. Now which ones are dissonant? Well, the remaining intervals are dissonant, easiest way to remember that, so that would include the second, the fourth, and the seventh, and all augmented and diminished intervals, which is why the fifth cannot be altered. So, the octave, if it's a perfect octave or a perfect unison, however you like to name it, can't alter it because an alteration of a perfect interval becomes an augmented or diminished falls into this category. However, the standard works. C to C. The third is a major or minor interval and thus either can be consonant. So I'll play either the major third, C to E, and the minor third, C to E flat. They both work nicely together. Fifth, when we get to the fifth, we call it a perfect fifth. And if it is perfect, it is consonant. However, if we alter it with a sharp or a flat, it becomes the augmented fifth or the diminished fifth, respectively. And either of those are augmented or diminished, so they fall into dissonant. And the sixth. The sixth is normally named as the ma uh, major or minor sixth, and thus it works as consonant or dissonant. Uh, and it will stay under consonant. Dissonant. 2, 4, and 7. They just are dissonant. C to D. C to F. C to B. And any alteration we do to those. So the major or minor second is dissonant. The perfect fourth, the augmented fourth, or the diminished fourth is dissonant. And the major or minor seventh is also dissonant. Why is consonance and dissonance important? Well, Consonance and dissonance contributes to both melodic and harmonic motion, that is, a melody line. So, any flowing notes are considered a melody, and we can measure the space between those flowing notes as melodic intervals. And the intervals, in some circumstances, should be consonant, in other circumstances should be dissonant, that is for a later video. Uh, as far as harmonic progressions, 
chords contain several notes at once, and those notes contain these intervals within the chord, and those intervals expand or contract a certain direction, changing the interval, another melodic movement, and the intervals they contain contribute to not only the tonality of that chord, but also where that chord would like to go next, so from chord to chord. For example, if I play a set of chords, <coughs> sense and the chords in general work well together. They want to flow the way they do. Another progression that isn't really as pleasing It's not awful, but it's not really moving. It doesn't have the power to it that, say, this progression does. second to last chord pulls towards the first chord. Some of that pull has to do with the internal intervals within that chord being consonant or dissonant. It has to do with a few other factors as well, which we'll get into later videos. Uh, and that pull is something that's very interesting because it guides us not only in composition, but also composition analysis and understanding how old music, old as in music that has already been written, not necessarily actually years old, was written and why it was written in that way. Uh, this melodic intervals with respect to consonants and dissonance also contributes to counterpoint or counter melodies. Now this is not what we'll be getting into next lesson, it will be a few lessons down the road, but there is something called cantus firmus, and that is bass line, or a pre-configured bass line. And that is simply a bass melody that has already been written. And counter melody is a melody that you write with respect to that cantus firmus. So the melody that you write the counter melody is known in the music world as counterpoint. And that is written with regard to the, some of these rules of consonant and dissonance. You can use consonant intervals here, you can't use them here, you can use dissonant intervals here, but not here. And we'll get into that in the counterpoint videos, which will be a, quite a ways down the line. From here, we're going to move into the C major scale, major scales in general, uh, diatonic chords, and harmonic progressions. So I hope to see you in our later videos, and please comment your questions below. I'm Ryan Neubauer with Piano Lessons 123. Thank you for joining me.